Welcome to the Genealogy Gems Podcast. It's a show filled with family history research strategies and techniques, news and entertainment, and inspiration. And I'm your host, Lisa Louise Cook. Hello and welcome to Genealogy Gems Podcast episode number 164. You are here with Vienna Thomas, who is producing our show, contributing editor Sunny Morton, and I am my descendant's ancestor, Lisa Louise Cook. Thanks so much for joining me here today. Now, you all know, if you've been listening to the show or reading the Genealogy Gems newsletter, that I have just moved to Texas. And uh, this is the first full episode from Texas. I want to start us off with a top 10 list. The top 10 reasons I moved to Texas. Number 10. They have something here. It's called weather. Number nine, I live on an acre now, so my neighbors don't complain that they hear me over here talking to myself. Number eight, there's a soft surrounding store in South Lake and a pottery barn and a coach purse store and a, well, you get the idea. Number seven, genealogy bloggers Amy Coffin and Caroline Pointer live here. If you know them, you understand. Number six, Wise County has just launched a new genealogy society and they wanted a speaker who lived less than three hours away. Number five, it's been almost 10 years since I filmed a reality TV show out here in Texas, so I figure they've moved on. Number four, my cat Ginger is from Texas and what she meows goes. Number three, after 18 years in California, I finally get to have a pool in my backyard. Number two, they don't have chicken fried steak in California. And the number one reason I moved to Texas, Davy and Joey. Can I Oh, that's a Joey. Oh, 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 oh. And I have to say, I have a lot more reasons than that, but those really are about my top 10. And oh my gosh you haven't had chicken fried steak if they don't cook it up in your neck of the woods you got to come out here to texas and go to babes babes chicken amazing and the shopping is amazing but i love living out here in the country it is quiet it is big there's lots of room and uh, i'm excited about the fact that i have a a new larger office uh, a brand new larger audio and video studio And um, boy, that just means so much more big stuff to come in 2014. I'm very excited about it. Let's see what is going on in the world of genealogy. There has been so much. I am just back from the Roots Tech 2014 conference. And um, I may have to still pull my head together about everything that went on. So maybe we'll cover that in our next episode. But I can tell you that the highlights were that I did teach a class on using YouTube for your family history. And I did the class in the in the first hour, right on the first day. And uh, wouldn't you know it, 10 minutes into a class about video, the power went out. So <laughs> we uh, struggled through that. I did my little song and dance for about 10 minutes. And then the power came back on and we had PowerPoint slides. And from there, it was smooth sailing. And I know that many of you have had, had an opportunity now to see my class on how to be an iPad power user. They have been posting the videos from the Roots Tech conference up at rootstech.org. Um, there's lots of great sessions there to tune into, but I'm really excited to say that uh, that class was videotaped and it is available on the website. And uh, just so you know, I, I don't know what happened, but uh, I turned in all the handouts and somehow they ended up reposting our organizational panel that I did with Denise Levenick and Allison Dolan as the handout for the iPad class. And uh, boy, that caused a lot of <laughs> consternation on the part of genealogists out there who wanted all of the step-by-step uh, tips and tricks that we covered in that class. It was a packed class and you really do need the handout. So I will have a link in the show notes, but I can tell you that the URL address for that handout for how to be an iPad power user is lisalouisecook.com slash iPad dot PDF. It's a PDF document that's a free download at my website, and you are welcome to go grab it, download it, and then watch the video. And 
And I can also tell you that even though we called it an iPad power user, really, if you have any type of, um, I was gonna say tablet, but I was, but really, it's any kind of mobile device, because it's all the same, whether you have a smartphone, whether you have a tablet, um, there's, you know, differences here and there. But the core items that we talked about really apply across all of those platforms. And um, the apps that we talked about are available both on the um, iOS and the Android platform. So I think you'll get lots out of it. And let's see, so I got back from Roots Tech and immediately, well, you know, I had just, I had moved, had been here about a week and a half, and then packed and took off for Roots Tech came back to a house full of boxes. <laughs> so um, Bill and I have been scrambling to kind of get everything put away. And you, you know how hard it is, you get so used to being on autopilot. You know, when you open this cabinet, this is where everything is going to be. And I don't know where anything is. Okay. So it's like you have to work twice as hard. It's bad enough as we're getting older, just to remember where things were when you, they've been there for 18 years. But now that everything has been mixed up and put in all new places, um, oh, it's just a, it's a wonderful hide and seek game <laughs> around here. But we're getting there. And, um, Ginger has made herself quite comfortable. She has become an indoor cat. I, I just not yet familiar with all the critters that are outside my door and I don't want her to run into them until I know who they are. So she is indoor cat. So far, all we have are bunnies in the, in the uh, yard. I don't think she'll have too much trouble with bunnies, but, um, she's actually enjoying it. She's like, you know, Miss Queen Cat now around the house and she thinks she owns the place and is having a wonderful time. And, uh, my dog Howie is here and boy, is he enjoying having an acre for a backyard. Um, he's a runner and he loves to run and he just makes the rounds and is having a grand old time. So we're all enjoying it's a little bigger and better out here in Texas and, uh, it's great to be here. Now, in talking about uh, what's been going on in the world of genealogy, uh, I, I ran across an article I wanted to tell you about. Now, a few years ago, while attending a genealogy conference, I decided to conduct some of those uh, on-the-fly interviews for the podcast. And I asked folks to tell me about their most prized family heirloom that they possessed. And I heard about everything from the doorknob of a woman's parents' bridal suite that was wild. I don't know how, I don't know how she got that. Um, to the bedazzling flapper dress worn by, uh, one lady's great grandmother. And all were really interesting, but I, I was stopped in my tracks. And I think I've mentioned it to you before here on the show that, that one woman looked at me and she just had pain in her eyes. And she declared, I have nothing, not a thing. My cousins destroyed everything. And it was really a difficult concept to digest. Now, I'm the uh, keeper of the family history flame in my family, and I've been really fortunate enough to have inherited an abundance of family heirlooms from both sides of my parents' families. How sad would it be to have nothing concrete to hold in your hand, N nothing to help you feel that the generations that held the item before? Well, since that day, I've remained inspired to help people find ways to track down information and artifacts that make up their family history. And time and time again, I found that just when you thought there was nothing left to find, an item will resurface. It reminds me of uh, one of my favorite movies, Galaxy Quest, and a quote from that movie, which uh, I'm sure was based on the famous words uttered by Winston Churchill in 1940. But it's a quote that I cling to when it comes to genealogy. Never give up, never surrender. And this motto has never been so gloriously justified as it was recently when a woman from Indianapolis, Indiana, received the surprise of a lifetime this last Christmas. The Purple Heart awarded to her father, a father she'd never met, was found recently and it was returned to her. You can watch a very compelling video on the show notes where this daughter holds the unearthed piece of family history in the palm of her hand and talks about what it means to her. And you know, uh, we were chatting about this over on Facebook and Kyla wrote a comment and she said, you know, I had old photos and letters returned to me by a woman who found me on a genealogy message board. Her father had obtained them from my brothers who were throwing them away. It was like a miracle. So if you need, 
just a little bit of encouragement that there are items still out there waiting to be found that want to be part of your family history. You got to check this out. This is an amazing video and I'll have it in the show notes for you. And uh, in other genealogy news, you know, we were talking about Roots Tech has come to an end, but the Southern California Genealogical Society Jamboree is just around the corner. And uh, I'm very pleased to tell you that I'm going to be heading back there again for the 45th annual Southern California Genealogy Jamboree. This is a, a huge national conference. It runs June 6th to the 8th in 2014 in Burbank, California. And the theme this year is Golden Memories, Discovering Your Family History. It it promises to pack tons of fun into a long weekend, of course, as it always does. And according to their press release, they say, uh, our heritage focus will be on European ancestors. Class sessions are scheduled for German, Irish, English, UK, Scotland, Eastern Europe, Italian, Mennonite, Swedish, and Russian, as well as African American and Jewish classes. Jamboree will be the culmination of a year-long celebration of the Society's 50th anniversary, and special activities will commemorate the decade of the 60s. So dust off your tie-dye tees and pillbox hats and take part in their Sunday noon fashion show. And the winner by popular vote, will receive a free registration to the 2015 conference. Now, as I said, I'm going to be there. I'm going to be teaching some classes. First of all, my first class is Who Needs Google Reader? Flip out over genealogy content with Flipboard. And here you're going to learn how to use that Flipboard app. We've talked about it here on the show as well as uh, in depth in the premium podcast and how you can use Flipboard, which is a free app to turn your favorite genealogy web content into your own free customized digital magazine. And uh, it is a ton of fun and it's perfect for genealogists as well as for societies. And then I'm going to be teaching a favorite, which is ultimate Google search strategies for genealogists. And, uh, and of course, we have that video for you premium members. You can watch it from the comfort of your home, but I will be teaching it there at Jamboree. And also how to create an exciting interactive family history tour with Google Earth. If you've ever wanted to tell your story in a way that would really captivate people, particularly the young people in your lives, you can use Google Earth to almost create what looks like a video game. It's pretty incredible. And I'm going to teach the attendees of the Jamboree step by step how to make that happen. They say here that uh, 2014 is going to welcome 55 speakers, over 60 exhibitors, 134 class sessions. What more could you want? So you can check that out. I'll have links for the registration and all the information on the show notes. And oh my gosh, talking about articles that have been out there, some really interesting ones lately. Uh, this was one that I post recently on the Genealogy Gems blog. It was called Genealogy Test Reveals Dad's DNA Swapped in Artificial Insemination. And it's not uncommon for genetic DNA tests to reveal that you're not related to the people that you thought you were. But in this case, it was a real twist that I hadn't seen before. A family who had a daughter by artificial insemination of the husband's sperm eventually decided to do some DNA testing for family history. So you can imagine the wife's shock when she discovered that her husband and her daughter didn't share any DNA. They got even a bigger shock when they did a little bit of research because apparently the biological father worked at the lab that handled the family's insemination process. The man is now dead, but it appears he may have deliberately swapped his own sample for the father's. And as I understand it, they may not be the only family affected. And of course, this brings up lots of questions, uh, including how many other kids received this guy's DNA. Turns out he was also a convicted kidnapper. Ew, this was awful. <laughs> My heart goes out to that family. And of course, to all the others who now fear that their genetic fatherhood was hijacked. Uh, you can read the whole story. It's popped up around the web, but it, I first saw it at KUTV.com. And I'll have a link to that story in the show notes. Oh my word, can you imagine? And also new out there, we've been talking about this on the blog that uh, we have been continuing to remaster 
and republish the Family History Genealogy Made Easy podcast. The most recent episodes we've got for you. Okay, episode number 16, we have the Family History Library Catalog. And in 17, we talk about actually using the Family History Centers themselves. And this is part one. You'll also find part two in episode 18. This is really a step-by-step uh, from somebody who's in the know, how to get the most out of a family history center. And of course, they're all over the world. And then using that family history library catalog to really catapult your research. So those are all in the family history, genealogy made easy podcast. If you haven't checked it out, you can listen to it over at the website, genealogygems.com, hover your mouse over podcasts, and then you can find the drop down menu. And uh, we've got this podcast, the Family History Podcast, and I've just added a page to make it a little easier for you to find the app for this podcast as well, which some of you were asking about. And there's Evernote news out there. I know that has just been taking the genealogy world by storm. And we've been talking about it here on the show. Of course, we have our quick reference guides available for you on the website. And I just wanted to mention, okay, so now they are available, our quick reference guides. They're four pages. We have them for Windows and for Mac. I know I heard from you Mac users. (laughs) We heard you loud and clear and we took care of it. We've got a great Mac version for you. And also, I know that many of you prefer digital versions of quick reference guides. So we've got both the laminated four page sheet or the digital download, whatever your preference may be. But Evernote did announce recently that that synchronization, how it synchronizes your notes through the cloud to ensure that you always have the most current note available on whatever computing device you're using at any time. Well, it's now four times faster than before, which is awesome. And this applies to any version of Evernote that you use. Sync now often takes a couple of seconds to complete. And when you get a new phone or computer, downloading your notes will take much less time. So if you have a small account, you might not notice that much of a difference. But if your account is a lot larger, you got a ton of notes out there, and you've been using Evernote for a while, wow, you're really going to see some improvements. And finally, some news from Billion Graves. They're now accepting your documentation. Uh, I'm hearing so much these days about source citation from from folks around the country as I travel. And I love hearing that. It means that people really are citing their sources. It's the key to genealogy success. Everybody seems to be getting smarter and, and better at sourcing their research finds. And genealogy websites are making it easier. They're paying attention. And of course, citing sources means it's easier to collaborate. And here's just one example, an announcement just made by BillionGraves.com. They said, after months of work in response to hundreds of user requests, I'm not surprised, Billion Graves has added several new features designed to validate and enhance the headstone records found on Billion Graves. The supporting record feature now allows users to upload evidence-based documents that support the Billion Graves records that have been collected through their mobile apps. And that means that users are now able to upload headstones, birth, death, burial, marriage, cremation, and many other types of records without needing a smartphone. Thousands of records are being uploaded every day and are breaking down genealogy brick walls and making connections that once seemed impossible. And they go on to say here, while working closely with our users and genealogists, we found that there were many headstones and burials that just couldn't be accounted for with our current systems, including unmarked graves, cremation scatterings, destroyed stones, and so on. Our supporting records feature eliminate this problem while maintaining the validity and accuracy of the Billion Graves database. We like to hear that, a focus on accuracy. So you can check that out at billiongraves.com. All right, well, coming up next, we're going to hear from you, and we will do that over at the mailbox. Bring me a letter from my old hometown. 
one with some jokes from my old pal Jim Brown. Bring me a letter from that girl of mine, saying that she's longing for me all the time. Bring me a letter from my proud old dad, who knows that we are winning, and I bet he's glad, but more than any other, Okay, here in the mailbox, I have some emails and uh, postings from all of you. Let's see here. Oh, <laughs> Joanne wrote in just a quick little email wishing me good luck in my move to Texas, or Bonnie Chance, as we say up in Canada, she says. Uh, she says that she's changed addresses 20 times between 1999 and 2005. Can you imagine? Oh my gosh. Teachers in Northern Canada move in August, out in June, she says. But she had a question for me, and kind of unusual. I, I don't know what it, what she was uh, needing it for, but I thought it brought up something that I could uh, share with all of you. She asks, is there a Google Earth CD of the 1932 LA Olympic Games? Maybe Joanne had a uh, ancestor who was in the 1932 LA Olympic Games. I don't know, but... I don't know of any kind of a CD or anybody who's put together what I call a family history tour of the Olympic Games on Google Earth. But this brings up a search technique that you could use for an inquiry like this or anything else that you're looking for when it comes to Google Earth. I was suggesting to Joanne that if I were going to look for some kind of Google Earth tour or CD or file, something that somebody's put together, I would go to google.com and I would search for in quotation marks 1932 because I would want that exact year to appear. And then I would also put in Los Angeles, but I wouldn't necessarily put that in quotation marks because we don't know for sure if uh, it's going to come up LA or Los Angeles or whatever. So it's an important location, but I'm not making it a mandatory result in quotation marks. But also in quotation marks, I'm going to add in my search query, Olympic Games, because I think I feel pretty confident that that phrase would appear somewhere in any type of uh, search result. And then also you could search the term Google Earth. You could try it with quotation marks or without quotation marks. Again, quotation marks make a single word or a phrase mandatory that it, that phrase or word has to be in every single search result that Google sends you. So with all of these, probably not the 1932 or the word Olympics, but everything else is probably negotiable. And so you could try it with quotation marks first to kind of narrow it down and then take them off and, and see how it goes. Remember, search is not always a one-time shot, but it might be um, a series of different tweaks to your search query until you get the kinds of results you're looking for. But most importantly, did you know that you could add .kml or .kmz to this Google search? And what that will do is it will spot any file that's on the web that's compatible with Google Earth. Because Google Earth creates .kml files, which are single items, or .kmz files, which are those zipped folders, which, which might include many items, which is how we create tours. And if, if you've uh, checked out the Google Earth for genealogy video CD series I have, you'll, you'll know how to create those. But even if you're not creating them yourself, if you'd like to do a search and see what other people have posted online, this is the way to do it. So Joanne and everybody else, put in your search terms, you can use those quotation marks to make those exact words and phrases pop up in your results. And then you could add .kml or .kmz to let Google know you're really looking for Google Earth files and see what pops up. 
I have a feeling that you'll have much greater success in grabbing those Google Earth files that may be online. And I have a note here from a concerned listener. It says, I have a dilemma I'm not sure how to handle. I have a recent ancestor that I never met, but my parents knew. And this ancestor did some remarkable things in his lifetime, but also some terrible things to members of his family, some of whom are still living. I want to write about the good things that he did, but I don't want to upset the relatives that he hurt. Do you have any suggestions on how to handle recent ancestors with difficult pasts? Keep up the great work. Well, this is a great question. I'm sure at some point we all kind of run into things like this. And I just want to read to you the uh, answer that I sent back to this listener. I'm sure different folks have different ideas on this. But for me, living relatives come first. If it causes pain to somebody living their life today, then I would hold off. I would also feel I was being somewhat deceptive to write up only the positive elements of their life. Deception can be created by omission, and our life activities are interconnected. For example, if a man built an incredible company, it might have been at the expense of his children if they never received his love or time. And that is part of the story. To tell the true and complete story, I don't believe that genealogists can cherry pick. And therefore, there are times when we must leave stories and lives alone until telling their stories would no longer cause harm to living people. I certainly would not want to allow the terrible things to continue by bringing it back up in public. That's just my personal opinion on the situation. I'm really interested to hear from all of you. Have you faced this dilemma? Um, have there been people that are still living who were affected by some of the uh, ancestors or relatives that, that you've wanted to write about, but realize that there was going to be some pain involved? Or have you been the recipient of that? You know, a lot of folks kind of just put it all out there and they think it's their right to do, but don't always think of the consequences. So would love to hear your feedback on this. I think this is a really important topic and one that we could all benefit from each other's experiences. Uh, or if you disagree with what I'm saying here, uh, let me know that at genealogy gems podcast at gmail.com, or you can leave a voicemail on the voicemail line 925-272-4021. I think it's great to have conversations like this. And I appreciate uh, the question because I think it says a lot about the writer of the question that they even stopped to consider the impact that they might be having. So kudos to you for doing that. some great news for all you genealogists out there. Roots Magic 6 is now available and it offers some of the most customer requested features like online publishing, the ability to search every record, not just people, an editable timeline view, which is really incredible, and new web tags, which lets you link people, sources, places, and research log items to web pages. Plus, dozens of other great enhancements, and of course, all the built-in features that you've come to enjoy. There is a little something here for everyone. Now, if you're already a devoted Roots Magic user like I am, or if you're looking to take the next step in your family history research and finally start recording your family tree in your own genealogy database, or if you've just been wanting to make a switch to a much more user-friendly program, there's no better time to get your copy of Roots Magic 6. Do it now. Go to rootsmagic.com and download your risk-free trial of Roots Magic 6. You'll see why professionals and beginners alike choose Roots Magic at rootsmagic.com. For the 
this gym, I wanted to explore the Ancestry Wiki, which is, I think, a great online resource that's fairly underutilized. But then I came to find out that Ancestry's own barefoot genealogist, Krista Cowan, had covered this in a great YouTube video. And since we don't all have time to sit down and watch a, a long video, I uh, asked permission of Ancestry to let me share the audio from that here on the show. And they happily agreed. So without further ado, let's check in with Krista Cowan and learn more about the Ancestry Wiki. Hi everyone, Krista Cowan here with another episode of the Barefoot Genealogist. Let's talk about today's topic. We are covering our family history wiki today. Now, if you're not aware, Ancestry.com has a wiki. Uh, a wiki is just simply a way in which we can put information online in an editable format, which means as that information changes or as new information becomes available, it's really quickly and easily editable by anyone in the community, including yourself. So you can add information that you might know about record types, about collections that exist um, in archives or libraries where you might live, but the foundation of the Family History Wiki on Ancestry.com is actually a, an amazing resource tool. It's an amazing research tool available to you to be able to discover what records exist, where those records are held, to help you learn a little bit more. So with that introduction, let's go ahead and dive in. I just have a few things prepared, and then we're going to actually look at the wiki. So here's where you're going to find this. And wiki is seen, wiki's kind of a funny word, and the fact that I keep saying it over and over again, it just makes it kind of even more silly. But <laughs> you're going to find the Family History Wiki by hovering over the Learning Center on Ancestry.com, and then you're going to scroll down to the bottom and click on Family History Wiki. Here's what that looks like. If I'm on Ancestry.com anywhere, you've got this Learning Center uh, button up here. Just move your mouse over it, and then scroll down to the bottom, you're going to see Family History Wiki. And when I click on that, it's going to take me to a page that looks like this. Now, one of the things about wikis is that they come in a standard format, which means we don't have a lot of ability to make it look pretty. <laughs> it's just a repository of information. And so we've done our best to, to do what we can, but this is the format that it's going to be in. So make yourself familiar with it. Maybe just spend a little bit of time looking at it and figuring out how that works. I'll show you a few things so that you'll feel a little more comfortable doing that. Um, one of the first things you're going to want to do is just explore to discover what's available. There's this kind of um, basic principle that I think sometimes we forget, which is you don't know what you don't know. And so we oftentimes uh, learn or approach research based on the information we do know. But because there are things we don't know, it never occurs to us to look for our family in that record or to research in this way. And so one of the really cool things about the Family History Wiki is that it gives you an opportunity to explore and learn new things along the way. There are a few tools we've provided for you to do that. <coughs> Excuse me. You can just click here in this Explore the Wiki section where you can, can go straight to the book, The Source, or straight to the Red Book. Those are the two books that we used to create the foundation of this um, database or every day there is what's called a featured article you can just click on that and read this featured article and that rotates it's kind of a random rotating article that just shows up so in this case today the article is selected proceedings and courts and so I could click on that and it would take me to a page that would tell me about um, court records and judicial proceedings and <laughs> court orders and petitions and anything that my, my ancestor may have been involved in um, adoption records or guardianship papers. Um, I know that in the South there are bastardy records, any of those that might have been records that were created, particularly as you start to get back into the late 1700s and early 1800s when census records become more sparse and then eventually non-existent, um, you need to start looking at other kinds of records. 
this is just one of those, this feature article is just one of those places where you're going to see things once in a while and think, huh, I don't know anything about that. Maybe I'll go read an article today. That's how I hope that you will kind of explore or um, just investigate what's available so that you might be able to learn something new. Now, of course, there are some specific ways to search the Family History Wiki, and I will cover those as well. Um, you can search, I usually do it by state, and then the word vital, and then I can search specifically for, you know, Oklahoma vital records, or, or California vital records, or New Jersey vital records, and it will give me a, an article that tells me when the state started keeping vital records, who holds those records still, and we'll look at that. So let's come over here to the wiki, and let me just show you a few different things so that you can be a little bit more comfortable working it on your own. Let's start with the source. So the source was published back in 1984, the very first time. I still remember when I bought my first copy of the source. I think it was about $75, and it weighed almost 50 pounds, I'm convinced. Um, I think it actually weighed like 23 pounds in reality. But um, it, it's just this amazing guidebook to American genealogy. And it was the, the one of the original editors was Lou Zooks, who was actually a vice president here at Ancestry.com. She's an incredible, incredible genealogist and human being. And she has, with her fellow editors, um, put together <clears throat> this amazing resource of record types. So basically the way that the book is organized, and you can see here from the table of contents, it's organized by types of records. So I could come here and click on census or directories or military. There's also some eth ethnic research guides, things like African American and Hispanic and Jewish and Native American. There's information here about doing re uh, research in colonial in colonial America, so colonial English records, colonial Spanish records, you know, who holds the records that were created before the United States became the United States, <clears throat> before Texas and California became part of the United States and were previously um, owned by Spain at one point. And so, I mean, you just start to look at where those records are for the Americas, um, particularly North America, before it became the countries that we know it as today. Many of us have roots in this country that go back that far, and so we need to have that information. So I can click then. What we've done is we've taken this table of contents from this book, and we've made every chapter or section of this book a link. So you can click on any one of those things to learn more about that topic. So for example, if I click on census, it takes me to this page that is an overview of the US census. Now, it's a pretty long article, but this article gives you really great information. And on almost all of these, you're gonna find, again, a little table of contents with clickable links. So I can come in here and I can say, well, really what I'm interested in is problems with accuracy in the census, or problems created at the time the census was taken, or here's a good one, instructions for enumeration. What were the enumerators told, the census enumerators, what were their instructions when they went around. So for example, there was a period of time where the instruction to the census taker was they had to return to each home um, a minimum of three times if they could never find anybody home. But after that third time, they could ask anyone <laughs> that was willing to give them information about the family that lived in that house. And so understanding that helps you understand why Sometimes information on censuses is so inconsistent. Maybe your family never even talked to a census taker. Maybe it was the guy that lived next door that had just moved in the month earlier and didn't even know really who those children were that ran around his yard all day. So you have to kind of understand about how and why and when and where and the conditions under which those records were created so that you can understand what it is that you're looking at. It, it kind of changes the way you look at a census record. And so this article provides you with some really helpful information, and you can jump to the different sections using this table of contents with the links. Now over here on the right-hand side, we're reading an overview of the U.S. Census, but I can also drill down to specific years of the census. So you'll see we have listed here all of the years of the U.S. federal censuses, 
I could go and read about information specific to that census. There's also information here about using sound X and non-population schedules. For those of you who aren't aware, there are other pieces to the census than what we call the population schedule, which is what we typically know of as the census. There are agricultural censuses that tell how many um, different kinds of livestock your ancestor may have had. Um, there are slave censuses in 1850 and 60. There are Native American censuses. There are, you know, there's all these different pieces and parts to the census. And what we typically know of as, as the census is just the population schedule. And so you can learn about some of those other parts and where they exist. And some of them do exist on Ancestry.com. There's also information here about state censuses. Many states also take a census and they do it every 10 years on the fives. So here in the United States, we take the federal census every 10 years on the, te on the zeros and the state censuses are often taken every 10 years on the fives. And so you could learn about which states participated in that, which states took those censuses, which states censuses survive, which ones are online. Again, all of that's gonna be in an article here on the wiki. And so I would encourage you to just, again, explore some of these topics or ideas. And then when you get to one of those articles, so for example, here's the article for the 1830 census, then I can scroll down and learn more about which what the specific questions were that were asked, some important facts, some research tips, and then here's my favorite thing on the census wiki. We have created here a table, or there has been created a table that compares every census from 1790 to 1940. It lists here every field that was uh, indexed or uh, enumerated, and then there's a little checkbox in the table here to tell you what years that information occurred. That's important, and, it, and it's something that I would hope all of you would spend at least a few minutes with or bookmark as a reference because I get asked questions every single day about information like this. Well, what does that column mean, and where does that information start? You know, when did people start recording the name of everybody in the household in the census? Well, that was in 1850. Prior to that, it only recorded the name of the head of household. Um, when did you start recording, when did the census start recording relationships of the people in the family to the head of household? Well, that didn't start until 1880. Again, this quick view chart helps you to understand that kind of information. And so I have a printed out version of this on my desk that I've that I refer to often, but I've also bookmarked this. So if I'm not sitting at my desk and I need to refer to it, here it is. You're going to find copies of that on several of the census, specific census pages. Now, let's talk about military records for just a minute. Another one of the categories in the source is military records. Um, I would guess that I get asked probably 10 or 12 times a week um, by people who are new to family history about why they can't find their own or their grandfather's World War I or World War II service records. Um, you may or may not be aware, but there was a fire in 1973 in St. Louis at the Military Personnel Records Department, and it destroyed about 80% of the military service records for men who had served in the U.S. Army um, during World War I and World War II. And so a lot of those records no longer exist. However, there are still other kinds of records. Um, there are veterans benefits, there are pension files, there are, um, there are uh, admission documents, there are draft cards. There are so many different kinds of military records other than just a record of service. And so if you come in here to this overview of military records, you're going to see, start to see some of those things that you might not have considered before because you don't know what you don't know. And so I come in here and I look um, at the different kinds of uh, the different wars that occurred or the different conflicts that may have been going on when my ancestor lived in a certain place. And they're done in a kind of a timeline format here so I can go through the colonial wars and then the post-revolutionary wars, and then what we call modern wars. 
just to see what conflicts were going on for people who lived here in the United States so that I know what um, service they may have rendered. A lot of us have fathers and grandfathers who served in World War II or World War I, but you start getting back into um, the Spanish-American War, the Civil War, the Indian Wars, the War of 1812, back up to the Revolutionary War, and then of course there were the French and Indian War before that, and, and so you just get this idea, this feeling for um, the specific time period during which those conflicts occurred. That becomes important not just because of military service, but also because a lot of those men who served were granted land grants, meaning they received property in return or in exchange for their service. And those land grants are important because they help you understand why your family may have ended up in a certain place. You know, maybe they fought um, in the revolution for, you know, the state of New York, but then they ended up down in New Jersey or they ended up over in Ohio. Um, all of that can be traced back in some cases to um, these land grants received for military service. So this helps you understand what conflicts occurred during what times, and you see this kind of timeline um, broken out with all these different um, wars, and then you can read more about each of those conflicts to understand the kinds of records that were kept around those conflicts. Sometimes they're specific to your soldier, um, sometimes they are just about the battles themselves, sometimes they're about troop movements, a lot of times what we're going to find are things called muster rolls, which are basically just an accounting every month of who was available for service and who was still sick and who had gone home to visit his family and who was out on a scouting mission. And, you, you know, you'll read through these lists of names that's basically just a roll call, but that helps you follow your ancestor through their service and kind of almost recreate that service record. So muster rolls are a really terrific resource. So all of that is just um, going to help you kind of understand more about the kinds of records available and then start to get a feel for where those records exist. Now, the second major resource in the Ancestry.com wiki is what's called the Red Book. The Red Book is um, kind of the standard go-to resource for American genealogy. If you need to know anything about a state or a county or a town in the United States, and what records were created by that entity, then you can, you, then the Red Book is the place you want to go. <coughs> Excuse me. It is organized. Um, there is some information about um, by record type, but mostly it is organized by location. So if I scroll down to the table of contents here, you're going to see it's just an alphabetic listing of the states in the United States. So I can come here and I can click on any one of these states and it will take me to a state research page. These are, every one of these is an article written by a genealogist or in this case two who are experts in research in that location. Oftentimes you're going to find maps um, that you can click on and expand. Um, in this case it's a map of all of the counties in the state of Illinois and you, it's a really quick resource again for you to be able to just visualize, well if my ancestors were living in this county, could this really be them I found way over here in this other county? in that census, or maybe should I be looking back over here by where they were born and married and, and lived their whole lives. So, it, so maps are a wonderful resource and there a lot of them are available here on these pages. It also gives you a history of the place. In this case, um, there is information about when the first settlers came. That kind of information is good for what we call a gut check. If you've got uh, events occurring in a location before people were living there. Maybe you've written a century down wrong or transcribed some inaccurate information. So having kind of an understanding of when the place was settled, not just when the place was settled, but a lot of times you'll find information about when major migration waves of people came in and where those people came from. A lot of times you're going to see large groups of Germans coming into an area or large groups of Irish coming into an area. And understanding those migration patterns might help you understand better when or why your family came into that location. And so those overview articles, that's the information that they provide. In this case, there's also information about, specifically about 
the counties in Illinois with addresses for contacting the county and a chart here about when the county started or when the state started keeping birth, marriage, and death records at the county level for those locations. And so I could come here and say, you know, Adams County, Illinois was formed in 1825. They started keeping marriage records in 1825, but they didn't start keeping birth records until 1877. However, their land records go back to 1817 and their probate records start in 1826. So that's how I would read a chart like this where I can just say, here's this county in Illinois. Here's where I'm going to be able to write to this address to get information that I might not be able to find online. And here's the information that exists at that county. So um, take advantage of those state pages kind of as an overview for that family history research. Now down the, the last thing I'm just going to show you here, down the right hand side of the page on every one of these state pages, you're then going to see a breakdown by record type. So once I get to a location, I might want to know, okay, well what specific vital records exist for the state of Illinois? And that will take me to an additional article that explains exactly when the state started keeping vital records. You'll see some links here. In this case, there's a link to the Illinois State Archive. There's a link to the Illinois Regional Archives Depository. Um, there's information here about how it was not mandatory that birth, marriage, and death records be kept until 1916. And so different counties may have different kinds of records. There's information about divorce records and marriage records. And then I just want to point this out um, as a special shout out. We have a user, because remember, when I started, I explained that wikis are editable, which is kind of a funny, awkward word to say, but there you can edit them, you can update them, you can add information to them. We've given you this foundation based on these two books, the source and the red book, but you can come in and add information that helps make it even more useful. So we have a single user who has gone through every single one of our state vital records pages. And at the bottom of the page, she has added, I assume it's a she based on her username, she has added links to where on Ancestry.com you can find the vital records for that state. So in this case, not just the state level records, but she's also listed some of the county level records as well. So it's just an additional way to get to the records that you're trying to find, which really is ultimately why you would use the wiki. You are trying to learn more about your family. You don't know what you don't know. And so we have provided in the Learning Center this family history wiki to help you explore, to discover what's available, to maybe learn something new that might give you an aha moment and revitalize your research. Or you can also use this Family History Wiki to search specifically by a record type or by a location to see what's available so that you can continue to grow your family tree, to learn more about your ancestors, and to tell their stories. Until next time, this is Krista Cowan. It's fantastic how the genealogy community online is growing by leaps and bounds. And one of the newest additions is Sandra Goodwin's new podcast. It's called Maple Stars and Stripes, your French Canadian genealogy podcast. I invited her to come on the show and tell us more about it. Hi, I'm Sandra Goodwin from Maple Stars and Stripes, your French Canadian genealogy podcast. Does this sound familiar? I have an ancestor who's one of the Philly Duroys. What's a Philly Duroy? My ancestor has two last names with a dit in between. What's a dit? I'd like to research your notary records, but I don't know where to start. If you've been researching your French Canadian ancestors and have run into similar roadblocks, then Maple Stars and Stripes, your French Canadian genealogy podcast, may be just what you're looking for. Join us twice a month as we explore different record groups, repositories, history, geography, culture, and genealogical methodology. 
And if French is not your native language, we have tips to help with that also. You can subscribe to the podcast in iTunes, Stitcher, or the Windows phone store. Check it out at maplestarsandstripes.com. Take the first step toward a smoother path on the road to finding your French-Canadian ancestors and join us at maplestarsandstripes.com. Profile America, Saturday, February 8th. Even in a world increasingly reliant on digital files and printouts, there's still a great need for photocopies. What is now old school was a breakthrough invention of a man named Chester Carlton, born on this date in 1906. In 1938, he developed a method of making dry copies of documents on plain paper, known as xerography, which we take for granted in using photocopiers today. Before his invention, copies were made either by using carbon paper when typing, or a mimeograph machine for large numbers of copies. Both were messy and not always legible. The first commercial copiers became available in 1959. Now making copiers is a $2.2 billion a year business for some 230 companies in the U.S. You can find more facts about America from the U.S. Census Bureau online at census.gov. Thanks so much for joining me for this Genealogy Gems podcast episode number 164. Thank you to Ancestry.com for sharing the wonderful Krista Cowan with us and uh, giving us so much more insight into the Ancestry Wiki. I hope you will check that out. And certainly check out all the stuff we've got going on at the Genealogy Gems website www.genealogygems.com. We've got the blog there for you on a daily basis. You can subscribe to that, stay in tune with what's happening. And also, of course, we've got the podcast episodes from this podcast, as well as the Family History Podcast. And under videos, have you checked out the videos? You know, video is like the wave of the future, and we're going to try and keep up as best we can. You'll find links there, not only to the Genealogy Gems YouTube channel, which is packed with free videos that you can watch on all different types of topics, but I've also got there for you a free one-hour class on Google Earth for genealogy. So I hope you will check that out. And again, stay in touch with me. Keep the conversation going at Genealogy Gems Podcast at gmail.com. Thank you so much for listening, friend. I'll talk to you soon.